This engine is powered purely by pressurised air. Which sounds awesome, but in reality it's just a well-timed valve that synchronises a burst of air with a piston moving up and down. Just look at that performance. Because the piston and cylinder are just plastic parts rubbing against one another, the engine is far from being airtight. It's like trying to inflate a punctured tyre. It's going nowhere. But I think I have a solution. This video is sponsored by KiwiCo. More about them later. A diaphragm is a disc of flexible material that is fixed around its outer edge but is free to flex back and forth almost like a trampoline, but with an airtight seal. This means we can make a diaphragm move by changing the pressure on either side, and I'm thinking this could be used to drive a piston inside of an engine. This would remove the issue of a non-airtight engine, as the diaphragm will contain all of the air. But this also presents another issue. We need to somehow control the air pressure above the diaphragm, perfectly in sync with the piston, without breaking the airtight seal of the cylinder head. So between the air supply and the diaphragm, we need to design an inlet and exhaust valve that operate with low friction and are 100% airtight. One idea I have for exhausting the gas is to make a small hole in the diaphragm which will be sealed shut by the piston. Then if we adjust the piston travel to be slightly further than the stretch of the diaphragm, it will separate from the diaphragm and break the seal. This hole also allows for access to the cylinder head which can be used to operate an inlet valve. The only engine I've designed in the past with an airtight inlet valve was my very first version because it didn't use any cam and pushrod valves like my later versions. Instead, it used a spring on top of the piston which would operate a ball valve in the cylinder head, keeping the ball valve closed as the piston traveled up and open whilst the piston traveled down. And this was the same design as the original Airhogs planes. Airhogs feature the revolutionary raid engine. So Airhogs need no gas, no batteries, just pump it up. And of course, I had to build a plane myself. The only issue with this engine was the spring, as it would often bend or break, resulting in reliability issues. Here it goes, here it goes, come on which I really want to avoid with this new engine. So here is my new concept. To start the engine, the output shaft on the right must be turned by hand, which through the gearbox moves the piston to the left. The gearbox isn't necessary, but allows for speed or torque adjustments if needed. The piston then seals against the diaphragm, as well as this brass tube sealing with this first o-ring. This is part of the inlet valve process, which works similar to a two-step airlock door where only one door can open at a time. So after the brass tube closes the right hand valve, the thinner pin opens the ball valve, which is holding back the high pressure air supply. The air then fills this volume inside of the cylinder head, but is prevented from pressurizing the diaphragm by the right hand valve. Then as the piston travels back towards the gearbox, the ball valve closes and the valve to the diaphragm opens allowing the stored high pressure air to enter the cylinder. This pushes the diaphragm against the piston, which accelerates it towards the gearbox. Then when the diaphragm can't stretch any further, it separates from the piston and vents the remaining air through the center hole, which then flows through channels around the piston and out through holes in the gearbox. This is still a concept as I haven't seen a valve design quite like this before, but if it works, it will make many sleepless nights worth the effort. So let's build a prototype. I 3D printed the parts using PLA filament supplied from 3D Prints UK with a standard 0.4mm nozzle. This required the layer lines in the cylinder and piston to be sanded, but at least the tolerances don't need to be perfect with the diaphragm design. The gearbox was also 3D printed and ran surprisingly smooth considering the small size of the gears. Brass inserts were made for the connecting rod between the piston and crankshaft to reduce friction and wear on the plastic. This could then bolt straight to the large gear and then the main cylinder can be attached, which makes for an intriguing mechanism to spin the shaft at one end and see the piston oscillate at the other. I then used a drill as a makeshift lathe to smooth the tip of a small brass tube and glued it on top of the piston as well as a thin wire, which will both be used to operate the inlet valve. Working our way up the engine, I then cut around the cylinder head to produce a circular diaphragm and used a hole punch to make a four millimeter hole in the center. The reason I chose this rubber sheet is because it expands a reasonable amount with just 30 psi of pressure, though it can't handle much more. But when it's contained inside of the engine cylinder, it should be capable of much higher pressures. I then installed the o-rings in the cylinder head, which will work as the seals for the two-step valve, and positioned a ball bearing inside of the top valve, which was held in place by a pneumatic fitting that will connect to an air supply. I then clamped the diaphragm between the cylinder head and the rest of the engine and we're ready for a test.
The issue I'm having is finding the correct length for the brass tube and thin wire on top of the piston. If the thin wire is too long, the ball valve will open early, causing air to flow straight through both o-rings and the diaphragm. If the wire is too short, the ball valve won't open at all. If the brass tube is too long, the right hand valve will open too late in the engine cycle, and the diaphragm won't be pressed against the piston. And finally, if the brass tube is too short, it won't seal the right hand valve, and the high pressure air will flow straight into the diaphragm, causing the engine to backfire. After many, many modifications, the engine was starting to show some potential. So now my new engine design runs, but if it's going to outperform my previous engines, it needs a large boost in performance. Fortunately, there are a number of things that can be easily changed. After three full redesigns, I increased the volume in the cylinder head by 300%, changed to a one-to-one -one gear ratio, and reduced the piston travel by two millimeters. This not only reduced the size of the engine, but also increased its performance. But we all know that noisier engines don't always go faster, so I built a test stand to hold the engine, which through a lever arm transfers its thrust force into a load cell, and we can then measure how much thrust the engine produces. For the air supply, I used a 2 litre bottle pressurised to 0.41 bar, or 60 psi, so there is always a consistent amount of air for testing the engine's efficiency. After running the test three times, the measurements can be used to plot a thrust versus time graph, which when averaged out, gives us an idea for the engine's max thrust as well as its runtime. With a peak thrust of roughly 0.87 newtons, or equivalent to 88 grams, it seems reasonable as the engine weighs just 72 grams. But how does this compare to my old engine? This test was done with the same propeller and pressurized bottle which revealed some surprising results. That's right, my previous best performing air engine produced nearly a third of the thrust of this new one. And if we measure the area under each graph, we get the engine's impulse, which can be used to compare the efficiency of each engine. Almost like it's miles per gallon, but instead it's thrust time per two litre bottle at 60 pounds per square inch, which shows the new engine to be 366% more efficient due to being fully airtight. I also tried the old engine with the smaller propeller it was originally designed for, which increased the RPM and run duration, but actually performed worse due to less thrust being produced. Also, the reason I kept the gearbox even after switching to a 1 to 1 ratio is because I can easily design a thread into the cylinder head that allows for mounting straight to a bottle, which makes for a perfect way to power a model aircraft. This engine probably won't power the future of our world, but it's this sort of problem solving that will lead the next generation to work on something that will. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects designed to expose kids to concepts in science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and are a great resource for learning at home. Each monthly crate is very well designed with an easy to follow instruction manual and educational magazine which I personally really like as building something is only half the fun. Finding out how it works can be just as fun, if not more. And did I mention they don't require any extra supplies, so there's no need to go to the hardware store. Relevant to my interest in pressurized air engines, this specific project produces its own pressure through a chemical reaction, which is released in an instant to launch a rocket skyward. What better way is there to learn whilst having fun, other than KiwiCo's crates? which are also a great gift option for the holidays. So go and check out KiwiCo at kiwico.com forward slash Tom50 to get 50% off your first month of any crate. The link will be down in the description below. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could leave a thumbs up down below. And if you're new to my channel and want to see other projects similar to this, then please click subscribe down below. A massive thanks to all of my supporters over on patreon.com for making these projects possible. I honestly couldn't do it without your support, so thanks once again. Thanks once again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.
Goodbye.